very interested in our last presenter since in my former career I was an archivist at the, at the Florida State Archives and used to go up to the National Archives quite a bit doing research. Uh, Trevor Plant is the chief of the reference services branch at the National Archives uh, in Washington. Uh, he specializes in 19th and early 20th century military records. Uh, he lectures at the National Archives. He's a frequent contributor to Prologue, which is their, their historical journal. Uh, he compiled a reference information paper called Military Service Records at the National Archives. Uh, he's a contributing editor to Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia of American Military History. He's authored and co-authored an article in a ma the magazine America's Civil War. Uh, some of his other works, I love this title, is, which was in prologue, The Shady Side of the Family Tree, Civil War <laughs> Union Court Martial Cases. Uh, and he's published several others, uh, other articles as well in prologue. Uh, he's also appeared on Discovery Channel, uh, on the History Channel, on the genealogy, the genealogical show Who Do You Think You Are, uh, as a speaker at many national conferences. He's also guest lectured at the United States Naval Academy and the United States Marine Corps Command and General Staff or Command and Staff College. And his topic today again is Civil War Records and Treasures at the National Archives. So uh, before I officially start, I'd like to say thank um, Patrick and Dr. Coles, uh, as well as Appomattox uh, Courthouse National Park and uh, Longwood for having me here today. I'd also like to thank you, Hardy Souls, for staying uh, till the end of the program to hear the last speaker. So with that, um, let's get started. So I wanted to throw out an example of this is not Civil War. This is from the Revolutionary War. Um, just to show kind of the, the depth of military records we have at the National Archives. So the earliest records we have are uh, Revolutionary War. So this is an oath of allegiance um, that George Washington signed at Valley Forge in May 1778. So the ironic thing about this is this is Washington's army coming out of the famous horrible winter at Valley Forge where the army could barely afford to feed them, clothe them, supply them with arms and ammunition but the army managed to send a bunch of these pre-printed forms to Washington to have filled out and returned to War Department headquarters. Uh, so this is Washington's oath. We still have oaths today. Um, if you're in the federal government, if you're an employee in the federal government, if you're in the military, if you're a politician um, on Capitol Hill, day one, you send a lot of paperwork. You get fingerprinted, raise your hand, uphold the Constitution, et cetera. Uh, this predates um, the Constitution, so it's a little bit different oath than we took. Uh, so you'll know it's printed and then there's a space in the middle where the officer could swear or affirm. There's a few religious groups at the time. There's a passage in Matthew they take very literally. This says you can't swear unto God, so they are allowed to affirm. The current oath today, it's both. It says we do swear or affirm. Uh, and then witnessed by Major General Sterling on, on May 12, 1778. And then most people ask um, about this officer because these are oaths of allegiance to the United States. We do have Benedict Arnold's oath of allegiance. <laughs> And the last four years, everyone uh, asked about the now most popular officers. We do have Alexander Hamilton as well. So to jump right into it, so kind of the, the most basic records we have for Civil War service for Union is uh, compiled service records, which I'm going to show you an example of. Uh, pension files, card and medical records. For Confederates, uh, compiled service records, which are on Fold 3, which is a partially fee-based fee site. Uh, prisoner of War records are on Ancestry and now on Full 3 uh, as well. And again, both of those are, are fee-based sites. So these are three um, what we call composite service records side by side. So these are the envelopes. And I wanted to show these to you because the biggest question we get is what do these numbers mean and what do they refer to? Because these are online, so people will see these online and think that these relate to other records beyond the composite service record. These are numbers on the back of the cards that are inside the compiled service record. So the one on the right, there's six numbers listed. There should be six cards in that envelope. And then the same with the one on the left, there's 12 listed. There should be 12 cards in that, in that compiled service record. There were no personnel files during the Civil War for either side, Union or Confederate. These were all done by the federal, war, federal government war department within the Army um, well after the war. For Confederates, it would have been primarily from uh, 1890 to about 1912. 
Union compiled service records, the bulk of those were, were started in the early 1880s till about the same time frame, 1912. So what they did is they, they went to existing records that were in War Department custody. So for a lot of the Confederate records, it was captured Confederate records. So on the card, so on the one on the left has company muster enroll. So this would be uh, Blunt Sutton's information from that original record. So a clerk would go through and anytime someone's name popped up on that record, they would create a card for that soldier. So whenever you see a company muster roll, it literally is like when we were kids in elementary school and your teacher took attendance, that's kind of what the muster was, is every two months, they would gather the men and you were either present or absent. If you were absent and they knew why, they would note that, so that's often noted on the, on the card itself. Um, if you were present, then it would say present, and then sometimes it would say if you were wounded or captured, like in the case in the, in the middle card. And on the, the next one, so these are the first two cards are related to this soldier uh, being a POW, and it shows his location. And then the third card is the Oath of Allegiance that he took uh, so that he could be released from uh, the POW camp. So I could do a whole talk on that process. Um, you could be paroled, you could be exchanged, you could do an Oath of Allegiance. So I don't want to get too deep into that, just know that he did an Oath of Allegiance um, during the war. The thing that's unusual about this case and why I picked him oops, was it's unusual to have to actually have the oath as part of the records. Usually the, the fact that the, the POW um, took the oath is usually in a register, so there's not actually the, the oath itself. So this one actually has the oath with his signature on it um, during the war. And then if that wasn't unusual enough, we also have an oath of allegiance where someone in red has written transportation to uh, provide it to Newton, Georgia. So it actually paid for him to, to go home. So we also have, like I said, we also have um, federal, so Union soldiers. So this is Sandy Willis, who was in the 4th U.S. Uh, colored heavy artillery. So he has 17 cards. Typically, um, there will be more cards for Union soldiers than Confederate soldiers. Most, not most, but a number of Confederate records were destroyed at the end of the war. When um, Grant's army was coming towards Richmond, there's cases, there's... Um, Cases of clerks in the Confederate War Department throwing reams of paper, paperwork, into fires, burning them so they wouldn't be captured. Some of the um, the, the uh, army records for the Confederates were put on trains, went to Danville, Virginia. They destroyed more there. Took more of the Carolinas, destroyed more there. So it's very limited to what we have at the National Archives as far as captured um, Confederate records. So this one again is Union, and again has muster in. A descriptive book, so a descriptive book will have what your physical description is. Um, the whole purpose of the descriptive book was in case you deserted, they knew who to look for. So it had your height, your weight, your complexion, your hair color, your eye color, etc. And again, with the same company, company information. So if you're a president, this is a great example of what I was talking about. If you're president, then there's no other information there. So this one has his muster out. So this is when he was mustered out of federal service and that would show that the information on, on where and when and if, if the government owed him any money or if he owed the government any money. So this one is unusual. So it's unusual for us to have a discharge paper. So for this time period, when you were discharged from, from the army, and this is the case for either volunteer regiment or the regular army, there was one discharge paper, and it was literally handed to the soldier at the time of discharge. So the only way that we would have it at the National Archives is if that soldier or their next of kin submitted it to the government as part of the pension claim process. So this is from uh, Sandy Willis's, in this case Wills, uh, he went by both names. Uh, this is from the pension file for him. We submitted it to the government as proof of service. And then medical records. Medical records are a little tricky. So for Union, those records are not in the compiled service record. That's going to be a completely separate set of records. Uh, for Confederates, those will be included in the, in the compiled service record. And then it's kind of the same concept. Anytime a, a soldier's name showed up in a hospital role, 
the clerk that created the cards, they would copy down that information when you went in, when you came out, what your, what your ailment or disability was, would show up on a card. These are, uh, so this one, I should have mentioned, I know it's hard to read. All six of those are Joshua Chamberlain's um, card of medical records. Tried to weed in as much Appomattox stuff for it. So this one um, is gonna be a little hard to believe. There was someone that got drunk in uh, Key West. <laughs> so this is a lieutenant who was drunk on duty in Key West of all places. So he was uh, sent to be drummed out of the army. So I don't know if you can see in the upper right hand corner where it has that the sentence was remitted, that's Abraham Lincoln's handwriting. And then his signature with the date. Um, so this case uh, was appealed, so they appealed it, and it went to the president, and then the president overturned the outcome of the case. This one is, this one is interesting. So this is a uh, Private Michael Delaney, who was in the 1st Colorado Cavalry. He deserted in the spring of 1862. They found him um, in the fall of 1862, went to trial. The officers decided on the case if you desert in time for it's punishment by death. So he was sentenced to be shot. Uh, it, it made its way up to the Army Judge Advocate General. As part of that process, the officers who sat on the case did a cover letter to Army JAG and said, even though he deserted, we found him serving in another Colorado unit. So he left for a couple months, came back, joined another Colorado unit. So the officers, kind of in an appeal to, to, to Army JAG, said, you may want to take that into consideration. So they sent it to Lincoln, and then Lincoln, all Lincoln had to do was write approved or disapproved. So part of the president's personality comes out, he says, let him fight instead of being shot. <laughs> hey Lincoln, July 18th, 1863. So with that stroke of the pen, he saved uh, Private Michael Delaney's life. There wasn't a lot going on in Colorado in the Civil War, so we know he survives the Civil War um, by his service record. He drops off after that, he never, Applied for a pension, his, his next of kin never applied for a pension, he's not in any of the censuses after the war, so he kind of falls off, we don't know what happened to him, but we can say um, quite definitively that we know he survived, he survived the Civil War. So this one is a record of death and, uh, and internment. I know it's a little hard to read, but um, it's for Private William Chrisman, who is in the 67th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, and it shows that he died uh, in a hospital in D.C. So this is, he will be the first military burial at what will become Arlington National Cemetery. So the reason I wanted to show this is because in the pension file, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about pensions in a little bit. So um, it's very rare for us at the National Archives to have personal letters between family members. Um, one of the few examples or cases, rather, where we do have it if, if those were submitted to the government as part of a pension claim. So one of the ways, um, during the war, initially you could get a pension. If you were the soldier, you were injured, you could no longer serve, you were discharged, you were an invalid, you could yourself apply during the war. If you died during the war, your next of kin could then apply, and again, this was during the war, could apply for a pension. That included widows. Um, if you weren't married, then your mother could apply if, if they could show that you were somehow financially supporting them. So we often have letters that, that family members, either the widow or the mother, submitted to the government, to the pension office as a claim, because in the letters they would say, you know, encloses is $5, encloses is $1 at the, at the bottom, et cetera. So this one is um, from the mother of, of William Christman. His entire enlistment period was like three months. He went into Pennsylvania, uh, the next month, he, he is writing a letter from a camp in Pennsylvania saying he's fine. The following month, he's saying he's not feeling well. He got, um, I believe, pneumonia, um, and then he died a month later. So literally like three months of service uh, and never saw, saw combat. Um, he literally went from Pennsylvania to D.C. She did uh, receive a pension. Another example um, is, and this has been a popular topic in um, the last five, 10 years, is women serving as men in the Civil War. So this is um, Sarah Edmund Seeley, who served as Franklin Thompson in Company F of the 2nd Michigan Infantry. So it took her about 30 years to get a pension. So uh, if anyone, if you've seen the uh, Disney movie Mulan, where she served and then the doctors figured out that obviously she was a woman when she got injured. 
Um, Franklin Thompson was injured and then deserted uh, because she didn't want to be found out uh, by union doctors. So shortly after the war, she puts in for a pension. They write back and say women didn't serve in combat units. She then writes in and says, but I did. And so then they look into it and she says, you know, this was my alias. They then responded and said, you deserted. And the law says if you desert, then you can't get a pension. So they kept knocking her out for all these variety of reasons. She kept going through her rep in Congress. And like I said, it took about 30 plus years for, for her to get a pension. But in this one, in the middle, underlined, it says, especially took the utmost pains to conceal the facts in the case and underline uh, utmost uh, pains. Of then at the bottom, she has, but being a woman, underlines woman, I felt compelled to suffer in silence the best I could in order to, um, to avoid detection of my sex. And then she underlines, I would rather have been shot dead than to have been known to, uh, to be a woman and sent away from the army under guard as a criminal, and then underline criminal. So um, in the research on this, and many people have written either entire books that are include her, there's a few kid books out on her, children's books, um, other ones where there's entire chapters on her and uh, women women serving uh, during the Civil War as men. So they think that there was one person in the unit that knew that she was a woman, that she became romantically attracted to, um, and then deserted. So no one else knew in the in the unit that this soldier was a woman. So as part of the pension process, they would send out um, inquiries to people that that served. So let's like, you know, who knew you, who you served with. You would write down their names. They would send letters to those to those soldiers and say, you know, do an affidavit answering these questions. So when you got later in the 19th century, veterans were used to getting this type of mail, accounting for people that they served with, to to say, you know, we are from the same hometown. We joined together. We served together. I saw him get get wounded, etc. So it's the same thing in this case where they're responding saying, "Yes, I knew. I, you know, I served with this, this soldier. I knew this soldier." They get to the bottom, and then the pension office is asking, "Did you know that that uh, Franklin Thompson was a woman?" And these guys are writing back, going, "I had no idea. My buddy Frank was a woman." So it's just interesting that they're finding out, you know, decades later that this, this soldier that they served with was uh, was a woman passing as a man. So this is also from a pension file. So this is Joshua Chamberlain's uh, pension file, just showing the multiple times that, that he was wounded, Gettysburg, uh, Petersburg, Caesar Petersburg, et cetera. This is one that was discovered. Uh, this is a letter that was discovered a couple couple years ago by one of our, our volunteers that was working on a pension file. So this is uh, Nelson Jabo pension. And it's gonna be hard to read the bottom, so let me read for you. <laughs> So at the very bottom, it has, um, starting here where the, the line is, it says, I write this by means of a friend who is now sitting by my side. So he's at Hayward General Hospital. So at the top, it has January 21st, 1865. And then at the top in pencil, someone has wrote a six. So um, if you ever do archival research, be careful with January because they do the same thing that we do when the year changes. Sometimes they don't change the date when they should. So this is actually January of 1866. So again, so he writes, um, I write by this means of a friend who is now sitting by my side. And then on the next page at the top says, and I hope it will be God's will that we shall meet again. Well, I send you all of my love and must now close your affectionate husband, Nelson Jabba. Nelson Jabba was illiterate, so he did not write this letter. So at the end it has um, written by Walt Whitman, a friend. So Walt Whitman uh, famously visited a lot of hospitals during the Civil War, befriended Nelson Jabo, and then this is his entire handwriting is, is Walt Whitman writing to, to this man's wife. So um, Patrick mentioned, mentioned earlier that you know, to a lot of people, Appomattox was the end of the war. This was a soldier who was wounded. So think about it. This is January 1866. To a lot of people, the war ended in April the year before. He's still in a military hospital from wounds that he received from the Civil War. So uh, Harewood um, General Hospital would close in May of 1866. They move him to another hospital. He'll eventually end up in a hospital that's for um, poor people run by the city. Um, and then he dies in December 1866. Never saw his wife again. 
So um, think about that. This is a year and a half almost after what many of us believe to be the end of the Civil War. He never went home, and it was a year and a half later that his wife finds out that he dies. So also in pensions, sometimes people will submit um, as proof of service photographs of themselves. And so this is Samuel Patterson, Patterson who was in the 32nd U.S. Color Troop. So Ohio home, so he was in the, in the, in the soldier's home. So this is him uh, in uniform of the soldier's home. So he's not in the Army at, at, at this point, but when you're in the U.S. soldier's homes, you wore a uniform, so that's why he's in, in uniform as an old man. So he's submitting this to the government as proof that he was uh, in the Civil War. And then another example, so this one is actually uh, from the Civil War time period. So this is William Rankle, Company E, 17th Missouri Infantry. So these are very rare. It's very rare that, that we come across these. Um, because we have so many pensions, people are still finding these periodically at the National Archives. Either volunteers, <coughs> staff, or researchers in the research room will open a pension that no one has looked at in 150 years, and then lo and behold, there's a, a photograph of the garotype, et cetera, in the pension itself. So I want to sh uh, throw in a few gems that we have. So this is one of them, if I can get this to change. So this is Robert E. Lee's resignation letter um, from the US Army. This is the one that no one quotes. Uh, so this is right after Virginia secedes from the Union. So this is 20 April, 1861. So it's Arlington, Washington City. And it's one sentence. It's him literally saying, I'm resigning from the um, from the Army, from the 1st Regiment of Cavalry, and then your obedient servant, Ari Lee. This is not the one that people quote. So this is to the Secretary of War, who's a political appointee that Lee has no relationship with. So this is as abrupt as you can, as you can get. The one that people quote, the one that's, I can't raise my sword um, to my state, that one was to Winfield Scott, who is one of his best friends in the Army and his mentor. Um, that one was not something the National Archives would have because that was a personal letter that he sent to Winfield Scott. This is his official resignation from the U.S. Army. The ironic thing about this is he's the colonel of the 1st Regiment of Cavalry. He's been in that role for less than a month. So Lincoln comes in, um, inauguration is March, March 3rd, so the month before. The colonel of the 1st Regiment resigned his commission to go south and become a Confederate. There's a list of promotions. So every time someone leaves the Army, there's a new slot open, and then people can move up. So Lee was, a, was the lieutenant colonel. So two months before this, he was the lieutenant colonel of the second calf. There's now an opening. There's a, a document with Lincoln's signature on it promoting, Rob, approving the promotion of Robert E. Lee to the, to the colonel of the, of the first uh, cavalry, U.S. cavalry. This is um, an interesting stamp. This is on all of our captured Confederate records. So there's a telegram um, from April 2nd, 1865. The commander that Grant puts in charge of the city of Richmond. So Grant's army comes through. He puts someone in command of the city itself. That commander, there's a telegram back to the War Department in DC that says we're trying to capture as much of the, the uh, Confederate um, Confederate rebel archives as possible. So they're calling it the, the rebel archives from day one, and that name stuck. So since then, within the War Department, after the war, within the War Department, in the records division, they created a rebel archives unit. So this was someone's office title for many years. Um, right after the war, the person they put in charge of it was a lawyer. Um, so a lot of people have speculated that this was part of the uh, case that they were bringing against Jefferson Davis. It's almost like a chain of custody case. So they wanted to stamp all these uh, as part of that process in case he went to trial um, for treason. So um, this morning, Jonathan White mentioned uh, the Lincoln movie. So in the Lincoln movie, there's a scene where Abraham Lincoln is in the telegraph office talking to the telegraph operator right next to him. That did happen. The telegraph office was in a, a space uh, next to the exec executive mansion, now called the, the White House. We have a number of telegrams that are handwritten by Lincoln that he then literally 
gave right to, you know, hand it to the telegraph operator. So this is one of the more famous ones. So Lincoln would grab whatever letterhead needed to be near, would happen to be nearby. So in some cases, it's printed executive mansion. Sometimes he wrote executive mansion. Other cases, it says U.S. military telegraph office at the top. So this one has uh, Washington, August 17th, 1864. Has cipher. You see where it's in quotes in the upper left-hand corner. Has cipher. So this would have been encrypted. So it was very easy during the Civil War to, to tap into the telegraph line and listen in to what was happening. So Cypher shows us that this would have been encoded. So the person would have had a code book, like a little code book, that they would write out. It would be English words, but if you intercepted it, it would be gobbledygook. You wouldn't be able to understand it. So they'd write it out in that code. Then the telegraph operator would use dots and dashes in Morse code. Go out to the other end, there's a war department clerk at the other end, dots and dashes, writes it out, it's a gobbledygook, pulls his code book, there's a keyword, and then he writes out what the what the actual telegram is. So this one, like I said, is in Lincoln's hand. So it's Lieutenant General Grant, City Point, Virginia. I've seen your dispatch expressing your unwillingness to break your hold where you are. Neither am I willing. Hold on with a bulldog grip and chew and choke as much as possible. A Lincoln. So this is shortly after the Confederate Army had gotten into Northwest uh, DC. So this is after the Battle of Monocacy. The Army is in uh, Upper DC. This is a month after that. There's a lot of politicians in DC that are very uh, nervous that Grant has, has stripped the fortifications of DC of too many troops to take with him on the Overland Campaign. So they've been putting pressure on the Lincoln administration and publicly Grant to return the bulk of the Army of the Potomac from the siege of Petersburg back to D.C. to better protect the nation's capital. So Grant sent a telegram to Halleck, the chief of staff. So that's what Lincoln is referencing, where he says, I've seen your dispatch. Lincoln would go through telegrams and read them. So he read a telegram from Grant to Halleck, then kind of inter interjected himself into the conversation, and this was his, uh, his guidance, if you want to call it that, to, um, to um, to General Grant. So there's no reading between the lines of this telegram at all. I mean, it couldn't be more, more forceful. So we also have unit records um, at the National Archives. After actual reports for both um, Union and Confederate telegrams, like I said, notes, correspondence. Um, a lot of that shows up in the OR, the War of the Rebellion, that's published and is now online. There's a lot that's not in the OR that we have uh, in our records. So this one is from the unit records from the 54th Massachusetts. So if you saw the movie Glory, this was the, the, the uh, unit that was highlighted in that film. So at the top it has a list of names and a list of men of the 54th Regiment Massachusetts Volunteers missing after the assault on Fort Wagner, July 18, 1863. So we know that these were all black soldiers because it was black enlisted men and white officers. It's uh, in order by company and descending order by rank. They did a quick roll call after the assault. They were the lead attack unit, and there was 106 soldiers that didn't make it back from that, from that assault. One of the other gems we have is the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. So it's a five-page document. And then the fifth page, what do you see? There we go. Um, signed by Abraham Lincoln. So this is one where um, parts of it are very faded, and so we only show the original of this. It's limited to 30 hours per year. That's the most that we can show it um, on display to the public. So um, if you ever see it advertised that um, it will be on display, you want to jump on that, because like I said, it's very limited to, to how often and how much we can display the original. Um, the other part that's difficult is two of the pages are double-sided. So when you see all five laid out, it'll show, you know, one's the original, one page is a facsimile, one's an original, one's a facsimile. And then um, wrapping up, so this is the Articles of Agreement, uh, Appomattox, April 10th, 1865. So these are the, the um, the officers, both Union and Confederate, that Grant and Lee um, assigned to handle how the uh, surrender would actually take place. And so these are these are their signatures. And um, Pat was mentioning how bad Longstreet's uh, signature was um, last night, and then mentioned that his uh, his right hand 
wasn't uh, was wounded, and so we did it with his left hand. And then we'll wrap up here. So this is a photograph. Um, they look like teenagers, because they are teenagers. Um, the guy on the right, this is a pension file where the soldier on the right, his widow was having trouble getting a pension from the pension office, submitted this great photo um, and said, here's my husband, clearly in uniform. So he was in, uh, he was in the army. So these are two friends that served together in a Massachusetts unit and then uh, within a week of each other joined the Navy. So um, at some point they went through their unit and said, uh, does anyone have any, any uh, sea, sea service uh, experience, and both of them did, and so they were transferred to the U.S. Navy from the, the volunteer army. 